take a look at a few news articles. We've got seven minutes. Um, I think I'll start with this one, which I thought is pretty interesting. Uh, the Bitcoin extremists uh, have this whole religion, how Bitcoin is going to save the world and it's going to replace all the government and currency and laws and everything. And so now they want to do that. They want to take over part of the Nevada desert and build an intentional community, a sort of commune, based on blockchains. And the local government is, uh, in my opinion, understandably skeptical, saying you're probably going to build a bunch of junk and then just go broke and leave, and we're going to be left with a bunch of people stranded that we have to take care of, which is what usually happens. And, you know, I think... Uh, <clears throat> but anyway, <clears throat> they want to do it. I remember they had a blockchain... Um, conference at the college about five years ago and I went in there and the very first guy I met said you should buy in now we're buying a bunch of land in the middle of a desert in an African nation that has no airports and no roads and every American company like Yahoo and everything is going to move there to avoid taxes and I said have you built anything yet like roads or airplanes he says no we're just getting the money now you could get rich 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 and of course none of that ever happened and this is what 90% or more of all blockchain projects are. They're just total scams. And uh, anyway, you got to watch it. They always promise everything until they get your money, and then somehow it all collapses and they leave and then start another one. Uh, so people are really in bad shape in Texas, of course. They don't have any power. They, they don't have enough natural gas. They don't have water. And... Uh, they're, they're yelling about how this happened, but apparently the independent grid ERCOT did not make their stuff um, able to handle this kind of cold. So we can expect a lot more of this. This is what all the experts said was going to happen with global warming. It's not like everything just uniformly gets warm. What happens is you disrupt the flows of material on the planet that control the climate, like the Gulf Stream and the uh, water flows, and people get weird, unusual weather that's not normal for that area. <clears throat> so this, I thought, was very interesting. Um, remember Mitch McConnell, uh, the inside story I heard on some podcasts is Mitch McConnell really wanted to vote to convict Donald Trump, but somebody talked him out of it. And that's how he ended up in this strange position with uh, him voting to not convict Trump on impeachment, but then giving an angry declaration that he totally deserved it, and he hoped he would get it from the private courts. And so, one of the Democrats is suing him under a KKK law, which seems extremely appropriate. And the actual original intention of this law was to stop organized mobs from blocking black people from the right to vote. And you could say that is exactly what happened. They. The mob that Trump sent there went there to stop the black areas from being counted. So it does seem very appropriate, and we'll see what happens. Many people have lawsuits lining up over financial and many other crimes. So we'll see what happens. Yeah, and I, Jim Kim is saying the same thing someone else said, is maybe people won't all rush to Texas uh, if there really is a big rush of people leaving California and going to Texas. But yeah, I think um, <coughs> you have to think in the long run when you're moving, you know. You have to think not just how things are right now, but how they're going to be for like 10 years or something. But anyway, so in Santa Clara, they have, this is something that people should have been able to predict. So as everybody I think knows who has tried to do this, you can't get any clarity about the vaccine. You can't get answers from people. Everybody just has a page up saying, we don't know anything, come back later, we'll call you, and then they don't call you. So you run around until somebody happens to take appointments, you jump in. And so what happens is a large number of people don't show up for their appointments, which is what will happen because they're probably surfing all over the web, signing up all over the place. And when they actually get in somewhere, they leave a bunch of abandoned appointments. But it's thousands of doses that are not being used and then being given to strange random people. So it's a problem. And uh, one of the many problems at the vaccine rollout, when you have a very desirable, very scarce resource, and you don't have an organized system for rationing it, then you just have chaos. People just mill around and jostle their way to the front of the line, and there's uh, no no logic. Anyway, this was this one's interesting enough. Let me open it in something that won't block me with a stupid paywall. Yeah, this one. Um, this is actually a very good idea, in my opinion. So the idea is that 
masks protect you from COVID. And that means the mask doesn't have to be powerful enough to stop tiny little virus particles. All it's stopping is little pieces of spit floating around in the air, which are pretty big. So you could just get an ordinary air filter at Home Depot and just take rubber bands and stick it to a fan and that will blow the air or suck the air through this filter and that will pick out most of the junk in the air and they they're trying to get people to scientifically test it and they say this probably will make you quite a lot safer if you just were to stick that in rooms where people are it would remove a lot of the floating drops and particles from the air which kind of point I've got an air purifier I got just because of all the smoke a while ago and it's really nothing more than this in a slightly more organized system so anyway that seems like a pretty good idea and uh might be something to consider. I got a minute and a half. Yeah, so yeah, I don't think that's that important. Uh, people are suing Amazon, saying that they are not protecting people from COVID in their factories. And the same thing's true of meat packers and a lot of people that are making people go back to work face to face. Um, and since there is no organization, a lot of crazy things are happening. Several big hospitals have contacted people who donated large enough amounts and said you get to go to the front of the line and school board VIPs and so on, and people are getting real upset. They're not sticking very clearly to the rules at all. Um, and, you know, an awful lot of vaccine has vanished. I would assume it will eventually come out that a lot of it has been sold for money in various ways. I wondered about this. Africa seemed to be doing so well with COVID-19, which is kind of hard to believe uh, since they have almost no resources. And now they're saying that's not really true at all. What's happening is they don't have any testing, so they cannot know who died of COVID. And if you just look at the total number of burials, it's like four times normal. So that probably a ton of people are in fact dying of COVID and they just don't have good statistics, which does seem more logical. Anyway, um, all right, so I think we're up to the official time here. And so here we are with 128. And I'm going to start talking about attacking Android applications. We'll be doing this for three weeks. <coughs> and I've got some demonstrations, including some stuff I can't record. Um, but I've added a couple new projects, and I'll show you those. So let me find my slides, which might still be open somewhere and apparently are not. All right. It's this thing. Yes, ah, here we go. All right, good. So the chapter is broken up into pieces, so I put the page numbers in my web page, and here's how it goes. So we're doing the first section and part of the next, and then uh, the others in the next two lectures. So you, you have your phone, which is running Android, which is running an app, and that's one device. We'll call it the application container. Then it has communications to the internet, and then to an internet server. So those are the three areas where you might be able to attack the app. So if you're going to attack the application container, then you're going to try and do something on the phone that subverts the security model on the phone. So the main thing there, of course, is to defeat the application sandbox, which we talked about. The Android sandbox consists of having a different user account for each app, and then the kernel doesn't let one user account see the other user's data. So you have to somehow escalate yourself to root is the most common way to get out of there. You could also put a malicious app on a device. That's really quite easy. There are lots of ways to trick Android users into installing malicious apps, and a lot of the apps in the store contain malware. You could get physical access to the device, and then if it's not encrypted and turned off, you might be able to get the data off it there. And you might find other vulnerabilities in apps like the uh, ES File Explorer we were doing before, where it is in fact listening on a port and doing something it shouldn't be doing, so you can just attack it. Then you can go over communications. You can redirect the traffic with art poisoning um, or a malicious wireless network. And so you can get yourself in the middle and then intercept and modify traffic. Uh, this is a common targeted attack when you get physical proximity to the target. It's not a very good way to steal a lot of people, people's data remotely over the internet. 
And then, of course, you can attack the server. This is <coughs> a very common issue. I have students tell me, I'm safe because I don't do online banking. I walk in and use a piece of paper. And I say, well, you have lowered the risk, but you haven't lowered the largest risk. The main way people hack into your bank account is by hacking into the bank server and stealing them all. Stealing the one account off your machine, one by one, is not very efficient. So you've lowered the risk, but you haven't lowered the large risk. And that's the issue. And as we said, uh, the mobile device vulnerability from OWASP list said the number one vulnerability is not even on the phone, it's on the server. Uh, the APIs on the server tend to have weaknesses, as we've seen. So anyway, so let's talk about the model. Here's the four components of an Android app. You have activities, which are the screens you can see. You have broadcast receivers, which are processes on the phone listening for signals from other processes. You have services, which provide service to other app, and you have content providers, which are databases storing data. And one of the things that causes weakness is if you don't explicitly tell it whether to export these or not in the definition of your app, then if you don't say not to, it will export all the content providers. The original theory of Android is if you have a database, you intend for that database to be available to all apps. They've changed that in API 17, which I think is Android 4 or 5. But um, older apps have this often exported publicly without realizing that. And so you define um, which API you're in with this target SDK version, which is in the manifest file. You specify what version of Android your app is written for, and you specify a minimum SDK version. And the minimum SDK version is the lowest SDK version on which the app will install. So I was doing more Android security audits this week, and there were some apps that I could not find when I ran Google Play on my Android 5 phone, but I could find them when I ran Google Play on my Android 8 phone. And I downloaded them on the Android 8 phone, pulled them off, tried to put them on 5, and then I could see from the error message in the log what happened. Um, they have an SDK version that will not let you install it on older versions of Android. <clears throat> So the fundamental biggest problem with Android is people keep using so many old versions. And we've seen this in a previous slide. This is from the first half of 2020, the most recent data I could find. And as you see, only a very small number of people are using Android 10. And a lot of them are still using Android 5 and even earlier. So people are using phones that are years out of date. And that's really dangerous. So you can, as I mentioned, you can explicitly export the component. And um, in the, I think this is in the Android manifest file, you um, specify a receiver. And when you specify it, you give it a name. And then you say exported equals true. So this is explicitly exported. Here's a provider which does not say whether it's exported. So it'll be, you'll get the default from the operating system. And that's true for SDK version less than 17 and false after that. <coughs> All right, so if you use an intent filter, it's exported by default. Now you see here I have an activity called image activity, and then I have this area called intent filter. And what the intent filter does is it listens for signals from other apps. Intents are the signals from one app to another. So if you are receiving intents, then obviously it must be exported. And it is exported by default. So you describe here what you want, and uh, people can send you images. So you're making some kind of activity that will process an image, and you're going to accept images from other apps. That's what this is defining. <clears throat> so you look in the manifest. Uh, you could just see these exported components. And we're going to use Drozer here. Drozer is the tool written by the authors of your textbook, which is a tool to make it easier to see the security properties of apps and perform some attacks on them. So there's a module called Attack Surface that tells you what's exported from every app. And so here it is looking at the default browser, showing activities are exported, broadcast exported, one content provider, and no services. These are the publicly available parts of the app that could receive a signal from another app on the phone, so that they call the attack surface. All right. And so you can then see the broadcast. Here's the broadcast receivers exposed by the um, by the Android browser. This is showing up. This is the app being analyzed, Android browser, and it's telling me the broadcast info. Here's the broadcast receivers. Uh, some kind of bookmark thumbnail widget provider, a download, accounts change, preload request. Those are what it has. 
and you can guess from the names what they are, but it's not incredibly obvious. And if you use the minus I switch, you see the intent filters for each one. So the book bookmark thumbnail widget provider has um, these actions, something called app widget update. So I guess that means you can use the default browser to present some kind of widget on the screen. Um, you can do downloads with the default browser, and then it will have some kind of download notification. And uh, here's this preload request thing, which I'm not quite sure what that is. But anyway, that's, that's one thing this tool lets you do. You could also see that by just examining the manifest file, but this tool makes it easier. <clears throat> it's kind of like Burp. I mean, Burp doesn't do anything that you couldn't do with simple Python scripts. It just makes it easier. So root and system are the high privilege accounts that can mess with any part of the operating system, even when they're not exported. So those are private components. They're intended to be limited only by internal use of the app, but if you are root, you're allowed to reach into other people's accounts so you can uh, target them. All right, so when you define a new permission in your app, like the one we mentioned last time, if you make a Skype app, which has some kind of Skype call, which is not exactly the same thing as a phone call, they defined a new, um, a new prefix for URL called Skype, and therefore they define a permission of whether you're allowed to Skype things, and that's a custom permission. And if you, the safest thing to do is to make your custom permissions where the protection level is signature, which means only apps from your company can use them. Unless you really want to let the whole world use it. And if you do, then you have to expect more malicious traffic coming in. Now, there is a trick to defeat permission levels, which worked in older versions of Android, before Android 5. If I wanted to take over the Skype Android permission, when you install the Skype app, it will try to install a new permission. But I could make an app, which I trick you into installing first, that defines that permission with a different security level, like normal. And when you install the Skype app, and it gets to time to define that permission, it will say, oh, this permission is already there, and it won't change the um, permission level. So the pre-existing permission will carry through its old security level into the new app. That's called a protection level downgrade attack. All right. All right. And so if you want to attack these application components, intents are these little signals sent from one app to another. And you can um, send a broadcast intent and start send an intent to a service. An intent can be generic. For example, it could just be, I want to open this URL. No more information. Um, so if I'm in some kind of app, and then I have some place where I can use a picture, like I'm in Twitter, and I have some option to send a picture or post a picture, I'll click some button here. It will then issue a start gallery. It will go over and open the photo gallery, which is a different app. Then I choose something, and then it sends a signal, now I'm done, go back here. That's how it works. And that's the idea. So you can bounce to another app when necessary. So you can start by an intent. Um, you define it like this. You define an intent object, and then you start activity on the intent. So an explicit intent is, of course, the most controlled way to do it, where you specify exactly which app you're talking to. And that would um, not let the operating system guess which app to send it to. It would tell it directly where it has to go. But of course, you can. what would you do if that other app is not installed on the phone? Then you might have a problem. So more commonly, you use the implicit intent, where you just want to play music. So you just send an MP3 intent and say, find some MP3 player and play it. And then there may be some default player. The app, the phone owner may have installed other apps, and it will pop up a box perhaps saying, which MP3 player would you like to use? Um, that's the other way. So here you have an implicit intent to just view a web page. I want you to open this web page. And that's all I tell you in this intent. So launch some kind of web browser and open that web page. If there's nothing else there, it'll open the default web browser. If they have other things installed, like Firefox or um, Chrome, it will ask the user, which one do you want to use? You can define filters, which specify um, what type of app can receive your intent. <clears throat> you can filter by any part of the intent. Uh, this, are we, this is what kind of intents your app will receive. Pardon me, I said it backwards. So, um, for example, scheme would be the scheme of a URI. This is what we were talking about with Skype. 
you can say the scheme is the start of a URL, HTTPS, or, or all right, and then there's the host, which is the host portion of the URI, the part before the company.com, www here. Then there's the port. Um, if you specifically specify a port, that's a port number, a TCP or UDP port. And then you can use path, path prefix, and path pattern to just be like grep. It matches a pattern of letters anywhere in the intent. This, by the way, is how PHP works, which is why PHP injection works so much on web pages. Many PHP filters in Apache have, they just, if anything has PHP anywhere in the file name, they interpret it as a PHP file. That's a fairly common mistake. Anyway, and then there's MIME type, which is the type of data specified by the intent. So you can filter on these, and you can make these things with AM, ADB to get to your phone, on a shell, and then AM is, is um, Activity Manager, and you can now issue intents correctly from the command line, which is a way to test apps. And this is really all that Drozer does. It just issues these commands for you. And you can go online and see a, a complete write-up of all the options in the Activity Manager. So let me talk about Drozer. Uh, this is Project M501. So if you go to the class here, and projects, uh, Drozer is here. And I'm going to just show you M501. It just walks through the standard way you start with Drozer. So you have to have Kali, and you have to have Android. And the Kali has to be connected to your Android by ADB, which you need for a lot of these projects. And then, uh, here, let me move this out of the way. All right. And then, it's interesting, it looks like it's cutting off part of my screen. Anyway, um, then you install this thing. You just get Drozer, um, install a couple of prerequisites, and you install Drozer in your Kali. Then you have to have an agent on the phone, which you just get from uh, the company that wrote it from their GitHub site. And then you push it onto your phone. So ADB install. That'll put it on your phone. Now, I've already done all that. So here on my phone, oh, not this phone. Well, I might as well do it with this phone. That would be fine. Um, sure, I think it'd probably be good to demonstrate the whole thing here. So let me see if I can get back to my settings. All right, here's my settings. Oh, this is probably an Android 5 phone. All right, never mind. I don't want to do an Android 5. When I tried it before on Android 5, it didn't work. I had to use Android 8. So I'm going to go back to my Android 8 phone where it's already set up, which I think is this one. make it a little smaller to fit in the uh, area that's being projected. There we go. All right. So my top secret pin. All right, here we are. So let me put these over here. All right, that's pretty good. So this is the agent, Drozer agent. You just push this on your phone. So when you, and this is, of course, the point. You trick the user into putting malware on their phone. Now there is some app on the phone that the attacker controls. And that's what this is. The Drozer agent is an app that lets me issue commands on the phone from my attack server. So when I run this agent, it's going to pop up. And I can turn on this server. It's already on from before, listening on this port, 31415. So I have to forward that port from the Android phone back to me. Now, let me, now I just changed phones here, so let me make sure I can connect. Let's go here to settings and get my IP address. Just search for IP. All right, so my IP address is 10008. Now, 
here's my collie. And let's make that big. There we go. Probably a little bigger even. All right. There. So I can uh, ADB connect to that address 10008 on port 5555. Okay, good. So now I'm connected. Now on my Drozer, agent is running. Okay, so now let me uh, just try to lay things out correctly here. I want to go here. All right, so I want to do this install. I'm going to move these instructions off the visible area there. All right, so I do that to forward the port. Okay, now 31415 on my local Kali will listen and communicate there. So now I can run Drozer with Drozer console connect. And it plays this graphics and shows me this stuff. So now I'm into Drozer and I can now issue some commands. So if I do help in Drozer, it will show me a quick summary of the commands. And if I do help shell, It'll tell me what I can do at a Drozer. I can do bang command or shell command to execute a Linux command. So, for example, I could do bang who am I. And the interesting thing here is, remember before, when we just connect with ADB shell, we're root all the time because this is a rooted phone. But now I'm not root because I have not opened a shell directly on the phone through Android Debug Bridge. I've opened a TCP connection to this app and this app is not running as root. This app is running as U0A84, just a normal app permission. So I can now test actions done from the permissions of an individual app, not from root, which is, of course, the more common situation if you're going to have uh, uh, control of an Android phone. The first you hit someone to install an app, you're not going to be root, probably. So if I do list, I'll see the kind of things I can do. and. Um, then we'll play some games here. Now there's an app called Civ that you have to install on your phone. And let me just talk about the instructions for a minute. Civ is a vulnerable password manager, just so you have an app to practice on. But it's, a, it's an app written only for ARM hardware, which is what most phones have. So you're not going to be able to run it on this x86 phone. So you download this thing, you install it, and when you try to install it, it's going to fail, saying no matching ABIs. This is an expected situation because I don't have ARM hardware. So what you do is you go here and get the ARM translation libraries. This site has them. You can just download them right from this site, or you can clone the whole repository with Git, or you can just download the zip file here and unzip it, and then you'll get all these ARM translation libraries for different versions of Android. And since I'm using Android 8, this is the one to use. You just drag this file, the zip file, on the phone without unzipping it, and then click through the prompts and restart the phone. And then your phone will have an ARM translation library, which will let you run ARM apps on this x86. I missed the part. Do both machines have to be bridged? Oh, well, they have to have some kind of network path from one to the other. And the way I did it was by bridging them both to my Wi-Fi card. Uh, there are other ways, but that seems to be the easiest. Yeah, both machines are bridged. They have to be on the same network. So my Android is 10.0.0, and so is my um, my Kali. If I go here, if I exit from here and do IP address, my Kali is also, my Kali is 10.0.0.10, and my Android was 10.0.0 something else. So yes, uh, we do have to have that. They have to be bridged to the same adapter is the easiest way to... Uh, to get that situation. Good. Questions are, of course, welcome. I don't want anybody to be lost. So anyway, once you've got the translation library on the phone, you can now install this um, Civ thing. And so let's take a look at Civ. Civ is this app, which is here just to show, to be a demonstration to practice. And this app, I've already installed, put in a password. I'm going to put it in. It's password one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And I sign in. All right. And now I can add, say, another storage here. I'm going to call this demo. And my username will be, say, Sam. And email will be sam at ccsf.edu. And my password will be secret 
one, two, three. So that's the idea of this thing. You can save passwords in it and save. And then it's got them, and supposedly you can only get them by logging into this app with the password. But as we're going to see, there are security flaws in this app which can be exploited. So save some passwords in Civ. And now um, there's a master password that gets you in there. And so if you want to see um, the apps, you, you can run this in your Drozer, run app package list. And when you do that, you get a long list of all the apps in the phone, which is something we've seen before. And if you want to just get Civ, you can do minus F for find Civ. And then it'll find apps with that string in it, I think. And so here's the name of the Civ app, com mdoorr example Civ. So if you want to see the basic information of your package, you use app package info like this. And all, these, all this is doing is looking at the Android manifest file and formatting the output to make it easy for you. So now you see, um, here's where this started, run app package info. And so it tells me the process name, the data directory, uh, the path to the saved APK, um, the user identity, and what permissions it has. Remember when you first install an app from Android Play, it says this app needs access to your photos and the internet and this and that. Here's what it has. Read and write external storage and internet. So it used those, the only three permissions it uses, and it defines new permissions. One called read keys and one called write keys. Um, this is M501. I see Tony TE asking a question, so that's it. That's what this is. Uh, let me bring it back on the screen. Yeah, this is M501, Drozer. All right. So let me get down to the... Uh, so now let's take a look at the attack surface, which is this one. You can run app. Let's see, I wonder if I skipped anything. No, that's right. Basic package info. All right, so that tells you basic information about the app. This tells you the attack surface. Pack, app package attack surface. And attack surface shows you the exported things in the app. There are three activities exported, two content providers, and two services exported. All right. So now we can audit those activities. If you want to, there are three activities exported. Those are visible pages to the user. That's what activities are. And you can get more information about them with app activity info. And this will give me the name of them. One is called File Select, one is called Main Login, and one is called PW List. And after the name of each activity is the permissions required to access that activity. And this is the kind of thing that is troubling. The Main Login activity sounds like something that should just open right away. So it's probably okay that you don't need any permissions to go there. It's not very clear what this File Select thing is, but this thing, Password List, that sounds like something that you shouldn't be able to just launch from outside the app, and it has no permission. So it sounds like launching this PW list would let me see a screen that I really shouldn't be seeing. So that suggests that something might be wrong there. So let's you see my Android device there. If you want to launch the PW list activity, you use this command here. And uh, let me just get it without the carriage return so I can talk about it. OK, this might work. Yeah. All right. This is app activity start. This is how you launch an activity. Then I have the name of it from here, which was com mwr example um, civ pw list. And here's the full definition of the app itself. So in this app, launch that activity. And this will be a request to that activity and intent sent from Drozer. So the other app on the phone is going to send this app a request to open that page. And when I do that, it opens this page, and I can now see the, the names of the stored passwords. I don't see the stored password, but I see the name of the entries, and this is something that I should not be seeing unless I've logged in first. So this is a security flaw in the app. This is basically um, one of the OWASP top 10 called unsecured direct object access. There is something that you should have to prove you have a password to get at it, but if you know where it is, you can just go directly and see it because it's not actually protected by permissions from that password. So that's one thing. All right. 
So now let's look at the content providers. To do that, you do app provider info. And that's the like same thing. I'm just getting the information about the content providers, which are the databases. And it will tell me what there are. And there is one called DB Content Provider. And then there's something called File Backup Provider. And the DB Content Provider has a path called slash keys. All right. Um, and this one requires that you have read and write permission those special permissions that only come with this app to get at this slash keys. But file backup provider doesn't require any permission and DB content provider doesn't provide and require any permissions. Now content providers, you need a URL to get to them. And it's not easy to find that URL, um, but Drozer will try to find it by just sort of hunting through the app for strings that look right. And that's called find URIs. So if you run that, it will try to find the path to the provided content, trying to hunt things, and then it found three of them. They all start with content, then it's the name of the app, they're all in DB Content Provider, and it said you can access keys with a slash, passwords with a slash, and passwords without a slash. And these last two look the same, but they're not exactly the same. And if the um, developer is not careful with the manifest, they might have not assigned permissions in a way that's really fully effective for both of them, and we're going to see that's the case. So the keys requires permissions. We saw that earlier, but evidently not passwords. So here is a command that will execute the passwords activity. This will run a query into the content provider trying to get at the passwords. And remember, I'm running it from the Drozer app, so I am not running it from inside the Password Manager Civ app. I haven't logged in. I shouldn't really be able to see anything. But you see, I'm now able to dump the contents of the database. And the contents of the database has the username, my name is Sam, and it has the passwords. But these passwords appear to be encrypted or encoded somehow. So I have gotten someplace where I really don't belong. So I've seen some security flaws, but I haven't really found the plain text password out of the app yet. So this is, uh, I'm just seeing it in an encrypted form. However, to break fast the encryption, you can do it with SQL injection. So um, you can run a query into this content provider. And here's a command that does that. So this goes into the same app provider in the DB provider passwords. And you can then do a projection and preload a single apostrophe. And this is the same thing as going to, say, a website in a PHP and just adding an apostrophe in the URL. We're trying to see an error. And we do see an error, unrecognized token. And notice, it's not just that the apostrophe is unrecognized. What's unrecognized is apostrophe from passwords. So it leaked some of the source code, which this is what SQL injection is like. The apostrophe I injected matched with an apostrophe from the developer. And now some of the subsequent text from the developer was misinterpreted as something else and created the error message. So I do have SQL injection. And you can see it even more clearly if you use selection instead of projection. Now you get unrecognized token while compiling. And you can actually see the command select star from passwords where. And this apostrophe didn't match things. So I can now see uh, this is classic SQL injection. It is actually SQL Lite, but it amounts to the same thing. And so if you want to see the names of the tables in the database, and if you've done the SQL injection in my other courses, you're used to this. Once you have SQL injection, you find the names of databases, but you often don't need to bother with that because there's a default database in use. Then you need to find the names of tables and the names of fields, and you can just ask it to tell you that data. So here's the one that tells me um, what the tables are. I do a projection, and I have star from SQLite master where type equals table, and then I have a comment at the end. This is very much like the usual um, SQL injection. And so I get the names of the tables. There's one called metadata, one called passwords, and one called key. And my 
window is a little confusing. All right. And then if you want to see the clear text passwords, it is this one where you just get the data out of the key. You'll get the clear text master password. I'm going to go into the key and just dump all the data from key. And if I do that, I get the master password into the app and also the pin, which we didn't talk about. It doesn't matter. But the point is now I have got the master password to the app so I could log into the app and get the stored passwords. So anyway, that's the fun stuff showing you these vulnerabilities. So it is nice and you learn a lot about Android internals by doing this. Uh, the problem I've, is I've never found any real apps with these vulnerabilities. I spent a while hunting for them. A lot of the other vulnerabilities I find all the time. I found several more today with simple vulnerabilities like local storage of, um, of passwords and broken SSL and things like that. But I've never found these kind of vulnerabilities in real commercial apps. Anyway, so this is what we did. Um, we've already talked about this. Uh, the SQL injection can show you the real plain text password to get into the app. All right, and so um, here's some more examples. Uh, here's a device lock screen requiring a password. So you can't get in. It's waiting for your password. But when you run the exploit, you get onto the real desktop. This is a lock screen bypass. These things are very common in Android and in iOS. I see them all the time. Uh, little kids find them often because just poking around, making an emergency phone call, taking a picture. Um, yeah, that, what, you, what you just saw was a SQL injection. Um, if you want to see the other kind of SQL injection, I've got that in my other classes, and I can bring that up. Um, let's go here to, say, 126. And um, um, it's in 127 anyway. Let me see how I can find my uh, SQL injection. I've got them. There, here we go. Uh, projects. There. So, yeah, the other, the other real SQL injection, not my SQL injection, is here. I see another question. How secure are password managers? Well, uh, the good ones are good and the bad ones are bad. You know, I mean, a properly designed password manager would not have these defects. Um, all right, let's take a look at SQL injection. So here, I'll just show you this one if you haven't seen it in the other class. So here is a place where you can search for people. So if you search for users, it, find, it runs this query. This much was written by the developer. And this came from me. And this was written by the developer again. So the only part of this I control is the name in here. And what this does is it fetches data from a database. It gets the names of, of employees where the name equals Bill Gates. And so it finds Bill Gates. So if the name matches, it finds the name. That's a query running as expected. And this is what's happening behind the scenes every time you go to like your email or your profile page on, page on Facebook or anything like that. It figures out who you are, and then it shows you your data, nobody else's. But if you have a SQL injection vulnerability, then you can do nasty things like this. If I had an apostrophe here, Bill apostrophe Gates, and run it, then it gives me an error message. And the reason it gives me the error message is I put in Bill apostrophe Gates, but what the program interpreted it as was where name equals Bill, it matched this apostrophe from the user with that apostrophe from the developer. And now it tried to interpret Gates as a command, and Gates is not a valid command, so it complained about that, saying, what's going on here? And that means I can now inject commands if I understand this language SQL. And so if you want to list all the tables in the database, uh, you can do this one. This will just perform the command select one, which is not very important, but it shows I can perform a select command. So if I submit this, it now gives me a result of one. So what it did was it looked for names where the name equals Sam, and there is no employee named Sam, union select one. I can now select an entire, I, or I write an entire select query and I can get anything I can name. So if I know the name of what I'm looking for, what table it's in, and what the field name is, I can ask the database to tell me anything, and I will find it. So now I just need to find those names. And for that, uh, there are some standard queries that do it. This is the one that will list all the table names. Select table names from information schema tables. So I put that in here instead of select one. 
and that will take this query, which only was supposed to take a name, and it will give me a list of all the tables. And I can see that there's a table called employees and a table called passwords. And that, that's how the start is. And then if you want to exploit it further, you can get the columns that if I wanted to go into, say, that passwords table, I could take this one and I can find, now I remember the table is named passwords. All right, so in the table named passwords, I want to find the names of all the columns. That's what this will do. So in the passwords table, there's ID and PW. So now I could get all the passwords by selecting PW from passwords. So that would be here. Select there. Select PW from passwords. And I think that'll do it. Let's see. Oops. Yep, now I get the passwords. So that's, that's how it works, and it takes a little while to get used to it because this language is a little funny at first, but you really always do that. You inject typically an apostrophe or something like that to see the error message, to show that it's vulnerable. Then you get the names of the tables, then you get the names of the columns, and then you just ask for what you want. And there are automated tools like SQL Map that do this, but that's what we did here. And I remember I also found it a little funny looking at first. But what we did here was, we again, you have to use a new unfamiliar language, this query language here. But this is what inserts a single quote as your query. And when you do that, you get an error showing some source code. And this, by the way, leaks out the name of the table called passwords. And then you can enumerate table names and see also there's passwords, but there's also another table called keys. So always type union select to search. Um, just select. Select is what searches. Union is what combines two select queries. So if you, a single select query is what you would normally use to run, uh, developers use. The reason why you need to do a union select is the more, you are typically not allowed to type in a query. You're only putting in something that's used as a parameter in a query. So yes, it's union select to add more to search. That's typically what you use for all the good stuff. Yeah, and it takes some practice. At first, SQL injection is hard to understand. All right. Anyway, so that's the game here. And uh, let me see if we got anything else to mention here. That's the lock screen bypass. This is the thing. You go to AM Start. You can just send a request to clear the lock screen, and it will let you do it. So if you control another app on the phone, you can wake it up past the lock screen without knowing the pin because they didn't really protect it properly. Another one is tap jacking. Um, quotation mark causes error. Yes, uh, the only point of the error from the quotation mark is that you can tell that there's the vulnerability. And that is what you employ. So the quotation mark is the denial of service attack, where you cause the app to make an error. And then you make a more careful injection that gives you control. This is always the way it works. First, you find a crash and then you improve the crash to get remote control. So another thing you can do is overlay a false user interface on top of buttons. So when people click buttons, they're actually clicking other buttons. This is called click jacking on web pages, and it's called tap jacking on Android phones. So you could um, add this thing called a toast, where you're playing a game, popping the balloons. And when you pop the balloons, you're actually installing an app and then approving the permissions. But you think you're popping the balloons because these taps are actually reaching a different user interface than the one you can see. Uh, this is part of why if you get a um, Windows machine these days, Windows 10 or any version since I think Vista, every time it gets your password, the screen turns gray because it wants to make sure that you can't be showing anything else on the screen except that one little box asking for your password. So you can't trick you into typing your password in just the wrong place with this kind of attack. That's called the secure desktop in Windows. So here's another one. I remember getting upset about this when I first learned about it on iPhones. When you close an app, it will like shrink it down. 
to a little crime. And when you um, sometimes it'll show you these thumbnail versions of an app. And that means it's making an image stored on the phone somewhere with a shrunk version of a page, and that page might include passwords or something. So this isn't stored in, in RAM and only available to privileged users, but on Android 4.3 and earlier, um, you could you could find these. Um, sometimes you could find them. And, and for Android 4.3, you could use a thing called a fragment to change the pin without knowing the old pin. That was a different vulnerability. There's just quite a few of these vulnerabilities that have gone by based on these knowing the Android internal features. And so if you sent this activity start to turn choose lock password, it would open choose the new pin page without having the page where you're putting the old pin first. Uh, so you could skip past the part where you prove who you are and just move to where you choose a new pin. All right, those are a few examples of what this has been, had uh, the result of this in the past. So let's try some cahoots. And this is 128.7a. All right, that looks pretty good. Well, looks like that's it. All right. All right, what component was exported by default? Content providers, databases. All right, what module lists all exported components? That's called attack surface. All the ways data can come in, each of which might, in principle, be exploited. All right, what intent filter can match any part of the data? right?
All right, what intent filter is at the start of a URI, like HTTPS. That's the scheme. All right, so I got Costas. All right, Peter. Felipe. Felipe. All right, good. So, stop the 